Hey friends, on Plain Spoken, I get to talk to a lot of people in a lot of places from lots of different backgrounds, and uh, today's guest is Maria Dixon Hall. She is an academic, but she's not the kind of academic I've usually spoken to. I've, I've spoken to a lot of high-minded Wesleyan academics that are wonderful. I don't mean anything bad by high-minded. And uh, Dr. Dixon Hall is not low-minded. She is also high-minded, but she's from a more emotive uh, field as, as I experience it. She's in the field of, well, it's not DEI, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but it's cultural intelligence intelligence is what I understand. She's active in the United Methodist Church, and she published an article several years ago now that I saw Lomparis, John Lomparis, repost on Twitter, and I really appreciated the the tenor and uh, the, the social location out of which uh, Dr. Dixon was speaking out of, and I thought, I really want to just speak with her for a little bit. I think it would be a great blessing to me personally. I think it'd be a great blessing to people who uh, spend time with me on my podcast. So um, even if you've never heard of her before, I mean, you probably haven't heard of most of my guests anyway, but I, I think this is going to be a real treasure. So um, let me read a quick bio for her, and then we'll bring her on screen, and then we'll see if we can't learn from uh, Maria for a little bit. So this is Maria Dixon, the Reverend Doctor, uh, got her MDiv and PhD. She's an Associate Professor of Communication at the Meadows School of the Arts at SMU, which I think stands for Southern uh, Millionaires University, I heard. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, in Dallas, Texas, Chief Diversity Officer and Senior Advisor to the President of SMU. So this is a very important, influential person we're talking to. She's an academic. She's a consultant. She's a theologian that believes that strategic communication is at the heart of every successful endeavor. She's a self self-described vocational mutt. She holds a BS in marketing from the University of Alabama. She's got a Master of Divinities and Masters of Theology from Candler and Emory, and a PhD in organizational communication from the University of Missouri, Columbia. She's passionate about helping organizations and small uh, and nonprofit leaders answer the question how do we communicate in a way that creates results, community, and transformation? She's been a frequent speaker and consultant to organizations and leaders across the country. Her clients have included Southwest Airlines, the Dance Theater of Harlem, the Ugandan American Partnership Organization, the Open Door Preschool, and the Lydia Patterson Institute, and the General Commission on Communication of the United Methodist Church. She's a, a huge fan of the Alabama Crimson Tide. I don't even know what that is, but I know she's a big sports fan, so I'm pretty sure that's it. Maria's married to the Reverend Jeff Hall, and they are the proud parents of a uh, an American Staffordshire pit bull terrier named, get this, Mr. Thatcher Stewart Wesley Hall. Can you believe it? Uh, and then they also are uh, successful foster parents, having adopted three children and then having an, uh, an honorary child as well that they've informally adopted into their household. So... Uh, at this point, I'd like to bring Maria on screen and welcome you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, it's a pleasure, and I'm really excited about our conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope it'll be good. I, uh, we prayed uh, just a minute before uh, we, we turned on. I, I pray that I, I get out of the way and I just let you shine, because I think your voice is— uh, Well, here's, here's the thing I was thinking about you before we turned on the cameras, before we even talked— it seems to me that you're a person who's designed your entire life around the ministry of reconciliation. Um, mm. You've done that in your marriage. You've done that with your children. You've done that at your school, and you're doing that in your denomination, just training people. Um, it, there is some conflict that is just necessary, unavoidable, but uh, what, I, what I hear you speaking out of is a sincere de desire just out of a conviction that if people just understood one another and stopped talking past one another— that um, there doesn't need to be nearly as much acrimony as we see now. Did I, have I gotten the right read on you so far? You've gotten the right read. I really, I mean, if I were to describe myself, I'd say I'm a bridge builder. Uh, and what bridges do is they connect two different points. Um, and that, you know, bridges are some of the most necessary things we have uh, in society. Everybody needs a bridge. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that building bridges is really what God has called me to do. Um, and it's something that I really enjoy doing. Well, from what I can tell, you're good at it. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't uh, hire you, and you've been all over the place. And the other impression I get about you is 
uh, you kind of do whatever you want. And not in a bad way, not in a spoiled way, but my understanding is you color outside of whatever lines people want to draw for you. Do I have the right impression of you there? You, I mean, I think that that has been an acquired freedom. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a Southern girl. I'm the oldest child of a, a Navy uh, chief petty officer and a mother who worked for the Defense Department and Veterans Affairs. So I'm used to pretty much having my life mapped out for me. Oh, wow. uh, and early in my life, I had it mapped out for me. I think it was when I went to seminary that I recognized that I just can't do certain things. I like, I like the freedom. Uh, and so uh, I got the nickname of Patton. Uh, for uh, George S. Patton, mm. uh, because my supervisors never knew where I was. They just knew I was off conquering something. Um, <laughs> and one boss said, can you at least call me in time that I can be on the promotion reel uh, mm. when, when you make your next success? So I always had a rule. So yeah, I color outside the lines because um, I think sometimes things are more connected than we realize. So we have these made up silos um, and I think what's affecting one part of the world or one organization is actually impacting other organizations and other people. Um, and I certainly feel that way about the church, the academy, politics. Um, and I think you, you've got to have a read on all that. So I'm out of the lines because right and, and honestly, uh, the world is out of line. Absolutely. Well, no disagreement here whatsoever. Um, I, I, I hope whenever I publish this to, to put in the show notes a, a, a talk that you delivered to um, a, a group of Texan United Methodists several years ago where you kind of explained a lot more about your ethos of how it is that you facilitate. Um, I've used the word reconciliation, but you've used the word bridge building, and so I should stick yeah. with that. And um, it, your your delivery style is indeed all that you convey that uh, an, uh, an undergirding presupposition that all things are connected and that um, you can't just treat one small part that that there is a holistic approach that's much more needed and you have a lot of nuance in that but you can also speak broadly and very concisely whenever you need to so you're you're very gifted in that way and I, I, I very much enjoyed uh, I, I wrote you early this morning. I <laughs> I woke up in the middle of the night and I just spent several hours watching and reading your stuff. So it's just clear to me that you're a very discerning mind, but that hasn't at all um, canceled out your clarity of feeling. You know, some people, they get so head oriented that they kind of get disoriented sometimes from their hearts and, and you still lead from the heart, but you don't let your heart discount your head. And that's, that's quite a rare characteristic. So, um, there, there are ways in which I wanted to give you a platform, and granted, there are not a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of United Methodists that don't like me, but for those who are willing to watch this, um, and for Global Methodists too, I thought you might have a word for us as well, but um, I, I, I wanted to start positive and then not go negative exactly, but just give you a chance to, to, to warn and, and see what you see coming down the line. You're, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're not a lifelong United Methodist. You started off Baptist, right? I started off Baptist. Okay, so let's get a little bit of your story as to what brought you into the United Methodist fold, and then I'd like to hear you speak for a bit about uh, your hopes, dreams uh, for what the United Methodist Church could be, what you would have them be, especially as they approach General Conference. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Jeffrey, and thank you for the wonderful words. I'm going to make sure that I post your introduction of me. Um, not only on my website, but on SMU's website so that my boss can see it because we're in the middle of performance evaluation time. So <laughs> I want to make sure the president sees it. Happy to be useful. You know, I, I, I started off, I'm, I come from a long line of Baptist ministers, um, both women and men. And um, so I'm, I was very ensconced um, in Baptist theology. I think that's one thing that Baptists really do well is that they make sure that their children are, and we have something called Baptist Training Union, where you understand what it means to be a unite. I mean, to be a, a, a Baptist. Uh, and we have to read a book, What Does It Mean to Be Baptist by Herschel Hobbes. And, you know, so I had that, that real distinct theology. 
Um, when I was, I worked for Dow Chemicals. So I, I, I graduated from the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, which is what we always say. Um, and then I ended up working for uh, Dow Chemical and was transferred to Atlanta. Um, and really experienced a re, a, a, I would say a, a quickening in my heart um, in which I really knew for the first time that I was saved. Um, and I joined what then became one of the biggest churches in America, New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, Eddie Long was the pastor uh, and I so, slowly worked my way up uh, to working in his women's ministry and those things. Uh, but as I would sit in church, lifting holy hands, uh, speaking in tongues, um, really getting into the word. This was even before seminary. I sometimes would look around um, and on days when I was confused, on days when I was in pain and I saw everybody up jumping around, I kept saying, is there a God that can speak to me? Because I, I, I'm like, I'm not praising today. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking in tongues. I'm, I, I don't feel praiseworthy today. The other thing I started thinking about was how the minister's sermon was affecting the way that the people lived and their values. Because I would hear people come back, you know, out of church say, oh, well, Bishop said this and Bishop said that. And in, in the, the Baptist church, I mean, they do have bishops, which is a weird thing. Don't get me started. But you know, I kept hearing how a sermon could shape belief and shape ideas, but it also could shape organizational fights. That uh, if, if the pastor wanted to get a point over about something in the budget or the direction of the vision or whatever, you can slide that in very easily into a sermon. And even though we have very sophisticated um, congregants, sometimes there is a confusion between what's God's word and what's, what's humanity's desire. Sure, yeah. I mean, and I think skilled preachers can do that really well. And so I became fascinated with that. Um, and so I ended up going to Candler against everybody in my church's will because they were like, oh, that liberal school, you're going to turn oh, sure. out bad. Yeah. Um, maybe they were right because uh, I went in my first year highly conservative, uh, I would say downright uh, anti-gay, um, anti-feminist theology, anti-womanist theology. Um, and I mean, I was, I was a handful in that first year. Um, and, but I kept, I'll never forget, I was sitting in a theology class and the girl next to me, I said, you know, there's only one authority and that's the authority of the Bible. And this girl sitting next to me says, I'm so glad that my tradition has other means of understanding what is true. And then she gave me the Wesleyan uh, quadrilateral. And I became so interested in that. And I, by my second year, I had left the, uh, the Baptist church. I started attending an Episcopal church. So I that, that was a little too cold for me. Um, and then I started attending the Methodist church. And it's been my home ever since, uh, especially when I started my PhD, went to First uh, United Methodist in Columbia, Missouri, um, and uh, have been a United Methodist since 2000. Um, and so my passion for the United Methodist Church is of someone who has found it, has found the expression that allows me to live fully in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm very passionate about this denomination. I'm very passionate about the things that have been happening. Um, and I, I've been passionately angry about some of the things that have been happening. Um, and so toward that end, I'm one of those people that is an idealistic United Methodist. Uh, my husband, who has been a cradle United Methodist, makes fun of me that I have a book of discipline everywhere I go. So I have it on my, my cell phone, I have it on my iPad, uh, it's always on my computer. Uh, it's right next to my uh, Robert's Rules. Um, because one of the things I loved that was much different than the Baptist church was that we had an order of doing things. 
we took time to write that down. We took time to say, here's what I believe. Um, and I thought that that was important, that those writings were done in community. They were done, and, and that when we join this church, we take certain vows to this church, even as new members, what we will believe, what we will do, what we will do with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Um, but even more so, when I think about it, I'm going to try not to get misty-eyed, when I kneel at the, at the altar to receive, you know, or, you know, but first commissioning and then ordination, those vows to me were as sacred as the vows I made to my husband. Um, because I knew what I was believing in. I knew. And I knew that I could only do that if I believed every single thing. Uh, and believed in the order that we were called to. So, you know, so when I get passionate about it, and it makes friends on the right and friends on the left kind of mad at me, because I really do believe this stuff. Maybe if I stopped believing in it, I'd be okay. But I believe in it. And I think the other thing that's influenced me a lot, Jeffrey, is the fact that I spend a lot of time in England. Um, both my husband and I spent time when we were in seminary. He spent more time than I did. He actually pastored churches over there. Um, and I teach every summer uh, in the UK for five weeks. Uh, and then I spend an additional week just to see our friends and his former congregants. And most of his former congregants who were young kids are, are moving into the ministry. And so one of his, uh, one of his young youth uh, members is now the pastor of Oxford uh, Methodist Church, which was John Wesley's church. Um, and so that's been exciting for us. But I say that to say I get to take a break from U.S. Methodist politics, and I get to go back to the British church where their concerns are evangelism. How are we going to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the people of the UK who need it so much? They're, they're not fighting over some of the stuff we do. And so it is a respite to me to spend that time there and to be focused on, to me, what is the central message of John Wesley. Um, how do we live out uh, this call? How do we move toward perfection? Um, and so being there, being in the home of Methodism, I get to hear a different message. I get to hear a different church. And I come back more grounded to have the conversations we have uh, here in the United States. Sometimes I come back a little bit more angry because I'm like, we've not made the main thing the main thing anymore. Uh, the main thing is not Jesus anymore. I don't know where Jesus is in any of this. Mm. Um, I, I really don't. Um, and so I, I look back and wonder, when are we going to get back to evangelism? And not book evangelism, but actually being able to tell the story of Jesus Christ in such a way that people know that he died on the cross for them, and he was buried, he was raised, and he ascended to the Father. And that he did this so that we could have a relationship with God. Um, and that it is life changing. It's life renewing and it's life giving. Um, until we can get our church focused back on giving that message to the world, um, I probably will be sad. Because um, I think a lot of the things we're fighting about are distractions and honesty. So I know we weren't going there yet, but, but, but that's really where I am. Um, and so as we get ready to turn toward general conference, I have to tell you, I am a general conference junkie. Um, I, I, as a new Methodist, I got all excited because I study organizations. Um, and so I just went to general conference. Um, and I got a chance to meet a lot of the players we're talking about. Um, and so my first general conference was in Tampa. Um, and I got to sit at the right hand of one of, to me, a great, one of the great Methodists, uh, Reverend Don Underwood, who explained the process of, of General Conference um, and, and allowed me to really be just the runner, the gopher, uh, as they were making deals left and right. And I just became fascinated. I, I told my husband, I said, this is the best way to have a vacation. And he just laughed at me. He's like, you are crazy. 
Um, and I will tell you, I've loved General Conference, even as contentious as it was, mm. um, probably up until we got to St. Louis. Um, and then I, I just, it, it started turning. And even as a delegate this year, uh, I've been, the, you know, we're the longest serving delegation that's never been to General Conference. Um, I'm not as excited. Mm. I'm really sad. I, I wanted to serve and continue to want to serve my church, to serve my conference, um, also to serve the order of deacon, because I think deacon's voices are needed right now. Frankly, I would say that uh, my beloved elders have made such a mess of this, um, and maybe if we listen to the deacons who are connected to the world, um, maybe you might get a different picture, and maybe we wouldn't fight over some of those things, but that is just a plug for deacons. Um, but I'm not excited about Charlotte um, because it's not going to be a happy time. There are going to be people I will miss who should be there that won't be there. Um, and that gives me great sadness. So I want to I, I, I want to give you a little pushback just to see what you'll say, because it's anybody should be on board with you saying, yes, we need to get or I shouldn't say we anymore, I'm not United Methodist anymore, but if I, uh, I were, I would 100% say, yes, we need to get back on mission, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It's the, the mission statement. For God's sake, we need to do it. But for people like me who left, that was really at the core of my frustration, which was, I don't want to make disciples that the pastor that follows me is going to deprogram and invert. Because, uh, to my mind, the whole crew is making diametrically opposed disciples. Some of the disciples confess mm. the fall and the absolute depravity of man and the need for a supernatural touch from God and a, a son who had to take our sins upon him and die as a penal substitute. And then the other side does not acknowledge the fall of man, does not acknowledge the need for blood to be shed in order for our atonement to be met will say things like we need to be brought close to God and can have a relationship with him, but they mean very different things by it. And they understand Jesus' ministry to be very different. Um, so to my mind, we were using the same words, but meaning very different things, diametrically opposed things by him. And at a certain degree, it feels like we're doing violence to the, the covenant where we're using the same words, but we're using them to justify whatever we want to do. And at that point, I, I got clear that 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 it was a violent covenant that, that did not hold the respect of many who adhered to it. And so I needed to get clear because many parties in the mix made clear that they would trample upon whoever got in their way without any um, uh, second guessing. So uh, d does that feel like a, an unnecessarily disingenuous way to interpret my brothers and sisters? Or uh, do, do you think that there perhaps is a world in which we can't really make disciples together because we're making... We're, we're understanding who Jesus is very differently, who God is, what the good life is, not just in different ways, but in diametrically opposed ways. You know, Jeffrey, I think, first of all, don't paint everybody with the same brush over on, on what you consider the other side. Um, I will tell you, there are colleagues, um, I, I don't call myself progressive, I'm a moderate. Um, there are colleagues that I think have gone way too far, and I have no problem calling them out. Um, there are some fundamental things we do need to believe on. We need to believe uh, in the very first, you know, three or four chapters of our discipline. If those become up uh, for debate, our theology becomes up for debate, then that's problematic to me. Uh, there is a Jesus. There is a Jesus who is born of a virgin. Uh, there is a Jesus who walked on this earth. There is a Jesus that was crucified uh, and, you know, died on the cross and buried and raised again. If we can't all get behind that one, then yes, we are creating, creating vastly different disciples. Um, and so I would say that. But I think by the same token, if we're talking about a Jesus that is punitive, we're talking about a Jesus that did not bring people together, a Jesus who worked to break down barriers, a Jesus who 
trampled on tradition sometimes, I think we're equally doing damage to Jesus. So I, I think that sometimes in our extreme, extreme points, we're missing the commonalities. But there's some things that, that I, will dis, I, I will agree with you on, that when we start getting to the point where we are, we are questioning the divinity of Christ, we are questioning the need for salvation, we are questioning whether or not there is a, a life more abundantly on the other side, as my tradition would say, of the Jordan, then, then that's problematic for me. Yeah. Um, that's really problematic for me. And, and so I know I have colleagues who uh, I would say are much more ideologically to the left of me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that has happened, and, and you know, this will probably get me some hate mail, but as a critical scholar, and, and I say that proudly, as a critical scholar, uh, someone who knows critical race theory, someone who knows Foucault, who knows all those words, I think one of the things that happened was that rather than really informing us and putting it in conversation with, some people took it out of the classroom and did not think about it pastorally. Sure. And, and I will tell you, one of the best teachers I had was Teresa Fry Brown. And she gave me a chance to lecture in my third year uh, largely because she knew I wanted to be a professor. And so I stood up in front of a group of people and I was talking about, you know, uh, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a child is, you know. So I got up there and I did my, let me shock them and tell them, this isn't about Jesus, this is about Hezekiah. And I mean, I really went into it. And, and I'll never forget, you know, she sat me down and she said, look, this is, your, your education is to inform you and to form you. But you have to be pastoral mm -hmm. when you stand before the people of God. Mm -hmm. And so everything that, that you get in the classroom that informs you does not necessarily have to be served to the people of God the way it was served to you. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened, and I mean this truthfully, is that I have colleagues who have taken a lot of, to me, important theoretical work important philosophical work um, that can inform us, but we've, we've turned out individuals who don't know how to make that pastoral turn mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and feed it unadulterated to the people of God. There is no, and, and let me be clear, so anybody who hears this or says I said this, I am a critical scholar. Love Foucault, understand the works of Marx, Derrida, all of them. Um, I understand Howard Thurman. I understand uh, the work of all of the womenists that are so important in my life uh, and their teachings. Uh, Renita Weems, et cetera, and Doris, Dolores. But there's a way that we can minister with all of them as that great cloud of witnesses that doesn't do harm. Hmm. I believe that. Um, and so I... I am saddened because I don't think sometimes that we have had necessarily seminary professors who really wanted to create ministers. Many of them wanted to just be academics. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a difference between creating people for ministry and creating people to be academics. Academics get to have a lot of fun because all we do is sit around and write papers and we talk and we think it is one of the greatest jobs I have. But when it turns to praxis, mm -hmm. how we practice that, sometimes the academy cannot understand how do we create a bridge between us and the church in this instance, us and young pastors or old pastors, rather than trying to fight. Mm -hmm. um, and now I don't want to blame all this on seminaries, but what I do when I hear when I hear concerned pastors like yourself talk about people being deprogrammed, those kind of things. I, I'm going to say that if that pastor is not pastoral with the things that they've learned, mm -hmm. that can happen on either side. And, oh, and well, I, yeah, and I would intentionally, if I followed a liberal pastor, I would intentionally deprogram the people from their theology. Yeah, and so it's not that I imagine that one side is more particularly averse 
to the other. It was right. that the UMC is a cradle of diametrically opposed uh, theologies. And I hear your pushback saying that, you know, there are some fundamentals that we still need to come together on. Mm -hmm. and, and to your mind, that is still basically the case. And, and I wouldn't belabor that. The, the direction I do want to go from here is to acknowledge that there are, you know, when you, when you caution, hey, you don't want to paint with too broad a brush, 100% with you. And it's, it's clear from your writings that you are not a far left crazy progressive person, you know. So um, uh, the, the article that, that you wrote that got my attention, it's called Progressives Playing with Fire, Mad Methodists, Burners, and the Myth of Prophetic Arson. Now, this was written in uh, 2016, and I mm -hmm. think it was right before the General Conference. Yes. Says, um, let's see, where does it, I, uh, whatever it is you're, you're saying, I might be crazy, but whatever it is, here's what I've got to say. I'm tired, all caps, I'm tired of all you progressive bullies. Burners, Bernistas, Methodists with an agenda, I'm tired of all of you. For months on end, anyone who would listen has been subjected to your self-righteous parochial ideas about politics, economics, the church, and the college football playoff. We have endured your endless protests, your slogans, your slogans with protests, and your fundamental unwillingness to engage in anything other than a total scorched earth campaign. And then you, you, you go through some, um, I'm on your side, I'm on your side, but you're just being so despicable and then the the article wraps up saying i'm scrutin down to the bottom here um religious progressives and political progressives are demonstrating why we are such an unlikable lot we are zero-sum know-it-alls who can never see the virtue of the other side who fail to exhibit patience for human growth or divine revelation for anyone other than ourselves and who then thwarted our int intellectually and as is the case of Nevada, physical bullies willing to burn down the house rather than let somebody else live in it. It's no wonder we don't get invited to many birthday parties. Bottom line, burning stuff down doesn't make you a prophet or a scholar. It just makes you an arsonist. <laughs> the end. Uh, no, actually, yeah. you had one more little. But it, it's a wonderful, concise writing, and of course, I 100% agree. Um, but I, I come from a different so social location than you. Um, I do think that... Tra uh, traditionalist conservatives and far left progressivists do behave differently. I don't think they're two sides of the same coin, um, but they do occupy two different sides of a continuum. I just think they behave somewhat differently. The, the particular uncharitable nature of progressives has, has struck me. That, that's what, I mean, I saw the same stuff and said, I can't be in fellowship with these folks. And even if there are very reasonable people like Maria, or Lonnie uh, Brooks. I just think the world of Lonnie Brooks. I mean, both of you have clearly a sense of honor and fairness. You do want um, liberal side to prevail, but you want it to prevail in the right way, on the right terms. You understand it's not a, a scorched earth thing. It's a, it's a loving, persuasive, um, vulnerable uh, thing. But even so, you're not able to keep the progressives in check. So Lonnie Brooks wrote an article, I don't know, a year ago saying, once the traditionalists are gone, the progressives are going to turn on the centrists. Uh, that they, they don't have any tolerance whatsoever for people who don't toe the line and get with the program. And so I, I sense in you, perhaps, and definitely Lonnie, trying to anticipate that and keep in check those elements that would otherwise just go buck wild at this point and uh, take over. Um, I don't want to be too uh, presumptuous in what your fears would be about the upcoming general conference, but I want to come back to where I started saying what would a best case scenario in Charlotte look like? If, if all of a sudden, whatever evil spell has been cast on the GMC, or on the UMC could be just undone and sanity returned and the better angels of their natures prevailed, what do you think would happen in Charlotte here this April or not happen? What, what do you imagine would be a best case scenario? The best case scenario to me would be for our brothers and sisters who have left to come back. Oh. Um, that I'm going to be honest with you. I this disaffiliation process for me. I'm sad. I am not happy. I am not dancing a dance. Um, I think you have to have healthy conflict. You have to have a pull, if you will. Because what it does is it helps um, keep you from going too far. On either side, 
And voices are important. And and I think we didn't listen to each other. So if I had my druthers, I miss some of these voices. I really do. Now, I will have some of my friends on the left say, well, Maria, they were very hurtful voices and they were very destructive voices. And I will say some of them were, but let's own our stuff too. And, And I think that's the problem is neither side really wants to own their stuff. And nobody wants to own, the house is burnt down, but nobody wants to own the matches. And I think if we both would do that, that's one side of humility. So in in Charlotte, the one thing I don't want is I do not want a victory dance. I don't want a, 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 a spiking of the ball. I want I want general sadness for the witness, for the people, for the servants who have given so much of their life to this denomination who have left. So, yes, we have to move forward. Yes, we're going to have to think about some new things. But I'm not doing it in the sense of victory. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it in the sense of disappointment that many people, and, and, and let me just say from the episcopacy, that I admire, that I love, that have prayed with me and been with me, to see the behavior that this pulling apart has done, and men and women of God I trust, has broken my heart. And so if I could see, and we could have, a moment of real grief about what's happened, then to me, that begins the humility that needs to happen. I'm a big that, fan. That's what I want to see. I, I, I want, that's one thing. I mean, I want us to do the business mm-hmm. of the conference, mm-hmm. and I want us to do it well, and I want us to do it with integrity. But, I, you know, we all know that everybody's getting in their own small groups and doing their own small things and getting ready for the legislation. We've been doing that for years. But I, but I want us to do it with integrity. I want us yeah. to do it with an integrity that does not reflect the behavior of the U.S. Congress. It's, it's hard for me to imagine, well, and I don't have to imagine it, but imagination sure helps sometimes to be able to see what that could realistically look like, especially after having seen the last few years. Before I speak much to that at all, you, when you speak to there needs to be grief, there needs to be, a, I don't think you said a reckoning, but I think you would say a reckoning with what's happened. There's, there needs to be humility that comes out of that. Uh, to me, to my understanding, the natural extension of that would be there needs to be repentance. Would you, mm. would you agree with that? Do you think an, a, 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 an ideal gathering in Charlotte would be marked by repentance for the unnecessary divisive behavior that's taken place in previous years? You know, I can see that argument because I would say many of us were not at our best selves. Mm -hmm. We were not at our most godly self. Um, I think many of us on both sides were deluded by our own righteousness. Um, And I would, so I would say what I really want to happen, I would dream that would happen. Again, imagination. Uh Yeah. Is that in our separation, in our decision, that the separation happened at General Conference, that there would be a prayer of grieving, and then with both sides there, a prayer of repentance. A prayer of repentance asking God to forgive us for breaking apart. Um, And then going our own, and everybody going their own way. Um, Because I think that's what's going to miss. That's what's going to hold up both the growth of both sides. I'm going to be frank with you. Mm -hmm. When you come with this much baggage, you're not on a a found a a, a really solid foundation. You're Mm -hmm. built on grief, grievance, and anger, Mm -hmm. and that is only going to breed more. And so you're going to breed more people 
Because think about all the United Methodists. Think about all the Methodists. Let's just use Methodists mm-hmm. who grew up watching the church from 2012 through 2019. What have we taught our young people? What have we taught them? What have we taught them about our denomination? What have we taught them about deliberation? What have we taught them about reason? Mm-hmm. We have created many me's who will continue this same destructive behavior because we normalized it. Huh. We've normalized the warring blogs. We've normalized the, the outrageous things that get said on the floor. We've normalized the things that get said uh, in Episcopal addresses that just rip people apart. We've, we've normalized Episcopal behavior that is just outrageous. So well, we... We're teaching our kids, we're teaching our young seminarians, this is how you do politics in the church. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to come back and bite all of us in the behind. Well, and I hear you saying the both sides stuff, and I don't want to be dismissive of that. Right. But to my mind, the, well, and you wrote this article at at, at which point we we crossed the Rubicon or, I don't know, Mm -hmm. there was no Mm -hmm. coming back point. It was right after... Uh, mm-hmm. Karen Olavito was uh, uh, the word isn't ordained but installed as a bishop mm-hmm. I'm forgetting the name of the article but I, I, I wrote down part of it <clears throat> you said like Brexit I believe my colleagues will find the next steps of the revolution are the most difficult a breakup of this magnitude will destroy not only our connection but will also have bureau- bureaucratic implications for the foreseeable future the problem as I see it is that everybody hates bureaucracy until their pension checks don't show up on time or the fund goes insolvent. Everybody decries the system until our jobs and grants at seminaries are lost. Everybody thinks Methodism stinks until the ministries and initiatives that could be uh, sustained through these connections evaporate when the connection is dissolved. Here's the, here's, I love this part. I sound bitter, don't I? No, I'm just somebody who got dumped the other night when I thought we'd agreed to see a therapist. I'm somebody who knows that you can't preach reconciliation when you're taking every step in the book to break a relationship apart. I'm someone who knows that in a world that is torn apart, where up and down and down is up, that the clergy of the UMC have abdicated their witness that those on two sides of an issue can come together as one through the power of the Holy Spirit. So whenever, I mean, that, that key part, I'm someone who got dumped the other night when I thought we'd agreed to see a therapist. That was such a good metaphor. And of course, you're a child of divorce as I am as well. Mm -hmm. And you've seen, I mean, when you're talking about a marriage, when you're talking about a a covenant relationship that you're trying to make work, even though you're not the exact same person, you see things slightly different ways. Sometimes it can be put together if both parties are willing to sacrifice. Uh, You know, something's got to die on both sides. Yes, yes. But when one party says, no more sacrifice. I'm on the right side of history. You are pulling against Jesus. I don't care what you get approved by majority rule at, at general conference. I'm going to have the bishop that I want. I'm going to let in whoever I want. And you can go suck eggs. I, I really don't care. As soon as you have a, one party saying that, um, that's when it's over. I, I don't know that... Um, I mean, it's at that point, I mean, as I read you, I, I think I hear you agreeing with me that at that point, you have no right to expect anyone to stay. You have invited them to leave. Um, yes, I agree with that. I agree. And, and I will tell you, that's when probably I broke. Um, because to me, we still could have kept this together. But the installation, ordination of... Bishop Oliveto, to me, was an unnecessary act of absolute defiance, Mm -hmm. both to our discipline as well as the spirit of those who wanted to try to work it out. Mm -hmm. Now, there are going to be those who said, Maria, how dare you? This was a a move toward uh, evolving the church. Mm No, it, no. Here's the... (laughs) Here's the deal. The deal is not at this point whether or not for me and and John, I need to I mean Jeffrey, I need to be very clear with your audience. I believe that our lesbian and gay brothers and sisters 
can be members of the clergy and can mm -hmm. be married. I have uh, an oldest son who is gay, mm -hmm. who works for the United Methodist Church, who went to Candler, who all of those things. But I will still say there is a way that there was a legislative way to get to where we want it to get. And rather than working together, rather than hashing it out like you do when you're in a relationship and sitting down and doing it legislatively, we flaunted our covenants. Mm -hmm. We flaunted, and, and, and the thing is, that was for me when I became angry with my brothers and sisters who were progressive because I'm like, wait a minute, we all kneeled at the same altar and we all took vows to uphold the same discipline. Mm -hmm. And we need to be ready if we believe in this. And, and I've written about this. I said I was always ready if my son Michael asked me to perform his wedding, I was going to happily give my credentials back over to the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. Because I want to perform that wedding, but I understood the covenant that I took with the United Methodist Church said I couldn't. But I would still continue to work for a time when my son's marriage could be recognized by the church he loves. Mm -hmm. I would still be an activist. I would still come to general conference with my legislation. I would still try to wait, hold the day with persuasion, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me, that action was the sign of really screw you. But they not they didn't just screw over, and I think this is a thing that needs to be heard. They didn't just harm the traditionalist. They harmed the centrist. Oh, sure, yeah. They harmed the moderates. Well, they harmed they themselves. Harmed you know, when you're talking about destroying the bureaucratic structure, at least, and the, the infrastructure that kept everybody afloat, I mean, all these things are going to come crashing down now because of that. So you're 100% right about that. So, I interrupted you. Keep going. No, so... so that's, that was my frustration when I was writing, and that was what I was pleading with. Mm -hmm. My progressive brothers and sisters to understand there is a pragmatic element. Mm -hmm. And so when they talk about Dr. King, Dr. King strategized every move. Every single move. And understood what one move would do to another system. Mm -hmm. He could have burned down the buses in Montgomery. Instead, he just said, we won't be on your buses. Right. Talk to us when you're ready. But we're not leaving Montgomery. We're not quitting our jobs. What we're going to do is show you the injustice of the system. Well, something I, I hear you decrying is that both sides were talking past each other and not listening. So what, what I would like to do now is uh, r put myself on the line as someone who's tried to understand progressivism and the people who, who subscribe to it and paint a portrait as to why it was that it was always going to go this way. And then at the, the tail end of this, maybe you can tell me what, what I've seen wrongly or maybe, mm -hmm. who knows. But as I've understood this, there is a classical liberal tradition associated with MLK mm -hmm. and non-coercive use of, of force and mm -hmm. bearing with one another over time and compromise mm -hmm. and negotiation. But that has been co-opted by far-left progressivism that's, that's oriented more by what I would characterize as neo-Marxism. Post-structuralist, um, I, I understand Foucault to be part of this, but also Marx, I mean, names you've, you've said, uh, mm -hmm. but aiming to tear things down that are less than perfect so that they can get power. And so uh, I see it having much more to do with Ibram Kendi and BLM, these people that uh, make the good the enemy of the perfect, and so um, focus on that, that it becomes untenable, it becomes uh, reprehensible to maintain the status quo. And mm -hmm. so you have uh, an institution that is ostensibly dedicated towards the liberation and um, blessing of all people, and yet you're tolerating these people who through their rhetoric, through their way that they vote, through the way that they conduct themselves in the world, are, uh, to their mind, causing gay people to kill themselves and hate themselves. They are an affront to God, 
that uh, why are we making room for these people? Why are we continuing to let them use this body that we love to do harm to the people that we love? Well, how much do we have to hate ourselves to continue to tolerate this when we can use the gears of power, the authority that God has given us to bring an end to this injustice right now? We've just been told we were baptized into this mission of doing God's justice and resisting evil, and then we're going to tolerate evil in our midst. And so as I came to understand this, I just got clear, there is no negotiating with that. There is no sharing a structure with people like that. My, my prayer was that we could all be adults and say, we don't fit together. We're doing very different things. We're oriented by very different understandings of truth and justice. The best we can do is uh, amicably split ways I, I, I thought the protocol for peaceful separation was exactly what the doctor ordered. It's still going to come before the general conference this year. Everybody considers it dead on arrival. But I think that was the best case scenario that um, progressives couldn't even live with that. And there were a number of maneuvers in order to to kill that. But as uh, as I recapitulate that, as I've seen that, does it seem to you that I've misunderstood progressivism and that there actually was a way that they could have held off and negotiated and run won the right way um or do you think that i'm right and that there really there really was i mean it sounds to me like you really did think it was a realistic hope to to keep them at bay till the battle was won um so have i misunderstood have I, where did i do the calculus different than you i guess that's the question i i, I think the calculus is different in in two ways there wasn't a willingness so, so let me just reframe this a little bit. There wasn't a willingness on our brother and sisters in the traditionalist side to even think that God might be doing a move, to, that the Holy Spirit was moving and asking us to rethink a position that we've held. What, um, what would that have looked like? You know, you know, to me, it looks really much like the evolution that our church had to go through to understand God's call to women, which was seen as abhorrent as one time, God's God's embrace of African Americans, and God knows uh, we have not done that one particularly well. Um, but that over time, we have been able to discern the movement of God, and that the only thing I ever asked of my traditionalist brothers and sisters was two things: one, keep praying. Keep praying for discernment. The second is, hear the stories of other people and understand how your language can hurt. Not your position, your language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How it can hurt. Mm -hmm. Because I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust the Holy Spirit to work in all of us. So, so that's the part. that Acknowledge the fact that God could be moving in ways that... that that the traditionalists did not see or understand or want to see or understand. Well, let me belabor this just a, a little bit longer, because to my mind, traditionalist conservatives did engage in the process in earnest, did engage in fasting and prayer for a prolonged period of time, and yet still came to the position that progressives were wrong. Um, so I'm I'm wondering what it is that you saw that gave you such clarity that that traditionalists did not engage in that process in earnest when as one who who was a part of that for some time it, it seems to me that that it did wh uh, where's the disconnect here i think the disconnect is what does that process look like to keep you in relationship mm -hmm. with someone who thinks differently than you are and okay. i think that was the point the point here is the fasting the praying the humility that it takes to stay in a relationship with someone you are, you've used the word diametrically opposed to, mm -hmm. that takes a lot. Mm -hmm. And and I think there became an impatience on the traditionalist side and a willingness to silence, and I'll be very honest, mm -hmm. silence the dissent. But on the other side, now this is where, you know, I'm going to make points with, with people who, who agree with you. On the other side, what they saw, they, they learned how to use the mechanisms of power sure. to get their point over. Yeah. But I think the other thing that we, we really did not understand fundamentally, and, and, and let me go back to this point. Sure. 
there are always going to be those, whether it's in politics or whether it's in the church, mm -hmm. who will seek to bring the beloved community or what they think is the beloved community in such a way that is destructive. Mm -hmm. But that is absolutely against the very tenets of critical scholarship. And this is, you want to, so you can tell I'm getting a little hot. You can do that, yeah, go the, ahead. The one thing that I tell every single one of my students, when we really, and here's the deal, Jeffrey, most people have not really read Foucault. They've read quotes of Foucault. Oh, sure, yeah. But they haven't read Foucault. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm one of the few, you know, I, I'll say this, at least in the field of communication, I'm one of the few people that read it in French. Wow. And correct all of it. Um, because they're missing Fouc a lot of Foucault's points. Mm -hmm. That it is within the connection that power can actually move and be productive. It is not through the destruction, it is through the connection. Mm -hmm. That we are made healthy by the connection and we can be, be made sick by the connection. Mm -hmm. And so it is in the connection that we learn to manage our meanings. It is in the connection that we learn to, to operate either regimes of power or regimes of liberation. What many of my colleagues on, and I would have to say the far left, mm -hmm. have failed to understand is that power is productive. Which means power is not bad. Power is not good. It is productive. Mm -hmm. But when it's held by one side too long, that's when it becomes destructive. And so one of the things that I would say to them is, what was your plan after you blew everything up? That's just my question. Because if you don't know how to put it back together, then don't blow it up. And so instead of working pragmatically, mm -hmm. there were a lot of opportunities, particularly, particularly in 2019, I would say even in 2016, that people could have worked productively. But instead, you know, there were just speeches that I think were so harmful to a spirit of compromise, a spirit of humility that could bring people together. Um, I'll never, well, I, call, I call it the famous Ebola speech. Yeah, Berlin's, yeah. Yeah, that was, to me, that was absolutely, as the Africans would say, that's spitting on our shoes. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, that was just a missed opportunity and a failure of cultural intelligence to understand how to make the point. And that's what I mean. I mean is that they haven't studied. I don't think either side. Well, I, I will give the traditionalists a little bit of credit here. They have taken the time to truly understand the ethos, um, yeah. the logos, and the pathos of many of our African brothers and sisters who are on the continent in their various mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. I don't think progressives that have done that as well. So they lack a cultural intelligence. And we see this even when sometimes they're dealing with black folks here in this United States, mm -hmm. that we're still struggling with some of these issues when we're dealing in Hispanic ministries and all of that. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say this, that that inability to be patient, lovingly patient while advocating for progress, mm -hmm. is a flaw. It, well, it is also a big flaw. You know, and I can poke holes at liberals and progressives all day, but uh, uh, surely you understand something about the, the conservative traditionalist ethos is uh, a deep um, more being mortified at the notion that we could make space in the church for what the Bible deems as, as evil. Um, and so uh, these appeals for compromise and negotiation and sharing the same space you know, um, Second Corinthians, what fellowship has light with darkness, you know, um, come out of them. What, what is the point of being part of the church if it looks exactly like the world? You know, the, the difference between the church and the world being the world is not something you can opt out of, uh, but the church is uh, a voluntary covenant body. But whenever you have people that are intentionally joining so as to move the, the, the paradigm further and further left, and then they're they're continually making calls. I mean, this is what we've seen happen politically. You know, uh, American society has gone so far left, it would have been incomprehensible to people just 20 years ago where things have gone now. And it's because of these consistent, you, you create a new 
far left contingency and then we've got to meet someplace in the middle and then you just go out further left. And there are a lot of people like me who just, I am not interested in that at all. Uh, at all. No, no part of me is interested in that. And so well, yeah, I don't have this book, loyalty to Foucault. I just have this loyalty to how I understand the scriptures to speak, you know? So, and it's not that I expect you to agree with me so well, much as... And, and fundamentally, I don't agree with you on that point, but let, sure. let me say this. I think it is incredibly important mm -hmm. for you to understand that th this progressive tradition mm -hmm. that you're decrying is what allows me to speak to you without fear of lynching. And I, I, think, I think we need to understand that as we evolve, that is called progress. And every time we've had progress, we have a backlash to that progress. Mm -hmm. And so in that backlash, so I always tell people, after the Reconstruction, we got Jim Crow. Reconstruction was the biggest period of uh, the 14th Amendment, which we are debating right now in our society, came out of Reconstruction. It was like, how do we deal with people we don't agree with? Well, you're not allowed to burn the country up. That's what we came to the conclusion of. And here's who gets to be a citizen. And we made that very clear. So that 14th Amendment came out of a very progressive period in the United States. So progressiveness is not in and of itself a bad thing. We need to progress. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be ordained if we didn't have some progressiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I would say is I could find texts that would tell you that it's wrong for me to preach. And so the fear that many people on my side have mm -hmm. is, okay, if you're saying gays can't be in the church mm -hmm. and you're using the Bible, then you have found times where I'm not allowed to be in the church as a woman, mm -hmm. as a leader. Mm -hmm. Are we going to go back there? Where, where, how far back do we need to go? Yeah. You know, do yeah. we need to go back to Aunt B and Opie? Do we need to go back to yeah. All in the Family? where Archie Bunker could say the N-word on television and nobody blinked. Mm. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm yeah. a Gen X kid. Yeah. I, I'm a Gen X kid. Um, and I think some of the things that are done, um, we've gone too far and we've gotten out of over our skis. But mm. I think some of the things are done to say, look, we're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to do this in terms of politics because I think in the politic of the world, we do have to learn how to get along with people who are different than us, who mm -hmm. think differently than us, mm -hmm. who vote differently than us, um, who believe differently than us. But in the church, I think the thing that disappointed me, and again, hear me on this, is because the first act of the resurrected church, the formation of the church, was the ability to speak different languages to each other. Right, yeah. In unity. In unity. Yeah. That the, de the design was for us to be distinctive and different, but still be in unity. Yeah. And I think one of the things is nobody wants to be allowed to be distinctive on either side, but we want doggone unity. You can't have both. Okay. And I think what's going to happen in, on both sides is that they're going to become these litmus tests. That if you don't believe a certain way, you're going to get kicked out. So yes. this is the first of many splits. Yeah. And I truly believe that. This is the first of many splits. And once you start this behavior, then we start arguing over money. We start arguing over churches. We start mm -hmm. arguing over stuff. And we're not making disciples. And to me, we, we then go back on the promise of Pentecost. I hear you. And we I have you know, to own that promise. I, I would enjoy... I would love continuing this part of the conversation forward, but I, I, I have a little bit more of an agenda of, of ground that I want to cover, and uh, I would just reaffirm where I started, which is it's clear to me that even uh, wherever you, where you're speaking from is bent on reconciliation, healing, and, and mutual understanding, and I, yeah. I think those are wonderful things. So um, I, I wanted to have you speak to the role of African United Methodism um, in the current cultural moment. And then um, if, you, if you had some charity in your heart to, to counsel the, those who have left, um, speak to uh, the Global Methodist Church trying to welcome in uh, non-white, non-American uh, entities and, and how they can do that well. So um, 
could, and it's okay if you want to just choose one or the other. That's fine. But I, I figure I, I am particularly interested in hearing your thoughts on how it is that the United Methodist Church can, at this point, um, what what can the United Methodist Church do to ameliorate the disenfranchisement of the African United Methodist Church? Well, I'm going to say that the American church has made such a daggone bungle of learning how to relate to an entire continent. Mm. We have poisoned the well, and I'm talking about the American church. Mm -hmm. Our foolishness, our politics, our backbiting, all of those things, we have in we have exported that in many ways to our African Methodist churches, our African United Methodist churches in this sense. Mm -hmm. So the games that we play out here have now really begun to play out there. But we don't understand the cultural context that it actually can cost people their lives if we play those games there. And I, and I think, so I'm, I'm really frustrated. And as somebody who spends a great deal of time in Uganda, I'm really frustrated with a church that has not spent the time to become culturally intelligent about their brothers and sisters in Africa and only see them as a voting block. Mm -hmm. Only see them, and, and, and both sides have done that. And so, sure. you know, I, I'm just annoyed by that. Mm -hmm. Um... But I think it goes to something that is inherent sometimes, is utilizing some people as props to make us feel better about our own sins. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what do I mean by that? I've always been interested in the fact that we've had so many African American, particularly African American bishops. Mm -hmm. We have a high proportion of African American bishops, and we have a very small proportion of African Americans. Yes. And so I've always been interested about that. I've always been interested about what I consider the lack of investment in the African American church. What I consider the lack of investment in our HBCUs that are United Methodist. The lack of inve the true investment and engagement, rather than seeing us as a mission, see us as a partner. Mm -hmm. And this would go for the global Methodist church. Stop seeing us as a mission. See us as partners, fully capable partners that can bring things to the table. And it's not our job, and it should not be our job, to make everybody feel better for the history of the United States. But by the same token, do not tell me that slavery was a great internship program <laughs> And I was just, I, my people were just lucky to get in on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if the Global Methodist Church is going to be, utilize rhetoric that ignores historical reality, mm -hmm. then they're going to have a very difficult time. I mean, there's people, one of the people you really, really like a lot is Carol Swain. Yeah. And I think... You know, and so, you know, I, I'm just going to say Carol and I are not good buddies. Right. Neither are me and Glenn or me and John. But we, you know, there ain't that many black African. By John, you mean John McWhorter? Uh, yeah. So okay. there's, first of all, there's not that many uh, black academics in this country. Contrary to what Elon Musk might think, we make up roughly uh, 4% of the total population of PhDs. Mm -hmm. Which means if I line up 100 PhDs, only four of them would be black. Right. Clearly, we're not taking over. Clearly, clearly. Right. We, we, do, we are not taking over the academy. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing I would say about Carol. And, and I would say is that Carol says that she came to her position through a deep conversion to Christ. Right. And I would say that here am I, a conservative, I started off as a conservative, mm -hmm. who with a deep conversion to Christ became what some people would call, certainly my parents, more liberal. Right. How is it that either one of us has to be worshiping the wrong Jesus? Right. If we go by that. Yes. And so, you know, is, is this the, G, is the Jesus that 
that we're serving. See, I believe in the one that says there are standards, but it's also within love. Yes. And 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 so I'm I wonder because sometimes I read Carol. I read John. I read Glenn. I know them. I've heard them. I've sat around with them. And there is a lack of love, but there's a whole lot of anger. And so you so, don't see love and anger as parts of the same thing. No, I mean no. I, I can't. I can't say that because I get angry and I love. Well, but, yeah. But, well, and that's how but, I read Jesus. I mean, a lot of right. Jesus' words that I read are quite angry, but it's not that he never ceased to love. I, I think well, it's because he, he I loves, love that I get so angry. But but I think what happens is, Carol, John, Glenn, uh, these very prominent um, African American scholars mm -hmm. that you like a lot, and yes. I read a lot, yeah. um, and we know each other. Um, I would say are missing that point of being able to create a bridge mm -hmm. that it has never been. We've never been a monolithic people. No, and I would tell not. the global Methodist church, don't think of us as monolithic, of but course, that is yeah. sort of what we've done in the United Methodist church. So don't do it. If you guys are starting your new thing, mm -hmm. don't do it. Do not paint all Africans the same because Ugandans are different than Nigerians, right? Yeah. yeah. Ghanians are different than Congolese. So don't do that. Yeah. Learn each per e learn each language. Recognize that even if you think you're a traditionalist, you're going to have lots of differences that are it's sometimes going to butt heads with each other. And that you cannot determine fidelity through litmus tests and and statements that you know, it's like I hear many people on the right say, I hate those diversity statements. And I'm like, I do too. <laughs> Which is why I never had SMU require them. Uh -huh. Because either you're going to live it out or you're not. And I don't be believe in litmus tests other than the way you live and you conduct your life. Mm. And so, you know, Jeff, here's the question I would ask you. Because I think you're a, per you're a person I can ask. And I, if I ask my, 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 my children's godparents, who, you know, are very much to the right of me. It might cause a fight, and my, my good friend makes a great gumbo, and I don't want to do that. So here's the deal. The deal I can't make is, gumbo, so bring it on. So, right, so I'm not losing anything in this one. Yeah, there so, you go. Yeah. So here's the thing that I, I, I would ask you, is I read many of my colleagues on the right mm -hmm. as individuals who look at the brothers and sisters at the border as undesirable, unwelcomed, uncared for, mm -hmm. that they look at me as a black woman and say, suck it up. I don't see you as a black woman. I see you as anybody. Or you see me as a DEI hire, which means in some ways I must be defective. Mm. Uh, and by the way, just a plug to all your friends. There's no such thing as a DEI hire. I know you were trying to get out of that from, you know, an affirmative action hire, but DEI actually can't hire anybody. Just, I'm just saying. Oh, okay. Um, you know, but I would say this. I, I also would say that there is a meanness, there is a cruelty that I don't understand about books. And, and, and Jeffrey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an assumption. You're not far from Gen X. So some I'm of Gen the X. books no, no, no. that I grew up with, you know, some of the books I grew up with, yeah. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, mm -hmm. being banned. I can't understand that. Our parents allowed us to read that book and it taught more girls about what was going on in their bodies and, and, and it talked about it was a godly book. Hmm. And so I don't understand. I don't understand this intolerance. I understand fears about teachers maybe indoctrinating, but here's what I would say. Teachers don't have that much daggone time. They really don't. Hmm. And so as parents, we always have... We've always been the buffer between whatever came home from school. My kids go to a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. Trust me, every night at our table, we have to remind them what Methodism is. Right. So, so I have to do that. I have to understand that. But I, I'm really concerned about what I feel is a, a high cruelty by mm -hmm. many of my colleagues on the right. But if not that a willingness to get rid of the gospel when it comes to political means. Um, 
a tolerance for, in some cases, someone that doesn't have any, has not exhibited one godly trait. But we're willing, it seems like y'all are willing to put your hope in this person. And that scares me to death. Um, and so just help me. Where am I wrong in this? So, I mean, I, and I don't know how much ground could be covered, but I, I do think there was, I would, I would urge you to consider that there was perhaps some, um, something real whenever I said that the anger or the hardness is based in love, um, and that it's not actually, you know, as I read Jesus tearing the Pharisees apart or speaking against sin, I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that there are people who went away feeling as though he had been quite cruel and um, mm -hmm. hateful and, uh, and unfair and uncharitable. And so um, I, I, as I listen to these people, I hear them speaking out of love for um, a dream that once was and still could be about uh, a society that is full of resilient individuals um, trying to build one another up um, and seeing that, that that is being destroyed day by day. And then an openness. Um, I, I would just say I think most conservatives make room for the church and the state to be quite different. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is an openness to uh, God bringing up a leader, you know, just like Cyrus was not a Jew, uh, to make, uh, but yet uh, serve Jewish purposes in that, in that time, um, to, to be open. Yes, there are some people on the right who really think Trump is the bee's knees, <laughs> but there are a lot of people who just go, no, he's not a Christian. He doesn't exhibit Christian virtues. However, if uh, he's put in charge, he will benefit the cause of, of Christ because God is Lord over all, and, um, and the, the political agenda he has is, is in favor of those who actually are Christians. So whether or not you agree with that, I mean, that's a, that's a whole other thing. But that's how I rational, it make, makes sense out of the picture. As we're talking about the border, uh, I don't think anyone is demo denying the Imago Dei of, of people trying to cross a border. It's just this kind of practical perspective that in the case of the, the UMC, uh, a lot of people see the validity of is just like, we can't take care of everybody, you know, and we're not doing a good job of taking care of those who are here. So we, we have to prioritize and we're not the kingdom of God. We're a worldly nation. So are we going to have a government endowed with authority to take care of its own citizens or not, you know? Um, and then I, I forget what other political issues you brought into it, well, but, uh, the, but I find this interesting that we're not the kingdom of God when it comes to immigration, mm -hmm. But we want the kingdom of God in our White House. No, um, no, I don't. I don't think. I mean, there are some who would say that, but I wouldn't say that. I, I would. I would mostly say that. Um, I well, I'm a libertarian, so I want the White House and the state just completely out of the church's business. I want the church to be able to operate free of the state. Now, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not representative of all conservatives by any means. Right. Um, but uh, there, I do represent a strong contingency of mm -hmm. conservatives who um, most of us got very demoralized by the last several presidents not really being godly at all. And the last godly one we had really didn't do a great job. You know, so it's just, um, there's been a bifurcation of this expectation. There is a church where we want people to be holy, and mm -hmm. then there's a wider world where we just understand that they're not going to be, and we have to negotiate our way through the world. And that I think would just be considered uh, Christian realism or real politic. I don't know. Um, but that's conservatives do not feel the need as, as strongly as progressives currently do to make the kingdom of God and the state synonymous. You know, and, and here's what I find interesting is how we've changed conservatism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has radically changed. Right. Th this is not the conservatism of William Buckley. And, and I think there's something to be said about that. Mm -hmm. um, this is not William Buckley's conservatism. This is more the conservatism we inherited uh, from Jerry Falwell um, and his infusion and Pat Robertson into politics. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, go back and read Buckley and tell me where you find the kind of statements that are being made by what people are calling the conservative party. This mm -hmm. is not. Um, I, you know, whether you know it or not, 
a lot of indo you know i read both sides i i'm a moderate so i need to mm -hmm. but there are elements of conservatism i agree with right but that i agree with william buckley's conservatism and not what i call a very neo a neo modern conservatism that that totally excuse many of the conservative practices of a margaret thatcher of a um, george w bush of a George H. W. Bush, even of a Ronald Reagan, um, who is considered by some a great conservative, but I, you know, Buckley might disagree. Um, and so, I think that's my concern. Do you listen it's to like, much he, Tucker Carlson? I listen to Tucker Carlson. I think he's a charlatan, but that's beside <laughs> the point. I, well, I've watched Tucker's charlatan career. or not. He does put forward um, some actual political theory. Um, that that is informed whether or not he's being genuine about it i i can't judge any better than anybody else but he seems to be one of the primary thought leaders at this point of of conservatism in america um and some of the points he makes really are kind of hard to 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 easily dismiss although i'm sure they can be dismissed um but i i think what we're seeing right now is that um that leftist politics is kind of focusing in and getting quite exclusive and that on the right, it's really broadening out, and there's a large variety of opinions and positions you can take and still be considered part of the right. Um, and so that's, it's just a really weird moment we're living in, and it's hard for anybody to really take the fullness of it in and navigate it correctly. Well, when Mitt Romney is not considered a conservative, when Liz Cheney is not considered a conservative, that is not a party that is conservative, and that's not one that is broadening. As a matter, and now we're talking about individuals who have lived lives of service to this country, and I think that's the thing that frightens me. Well, so um, if, I if think this is real because I, I think it's about I mean, populism, right? So, like, well, go ahead, I'll listen. No, yeah. I, and here, and here's the deal. I think there is an a lot. What frightens me is more that the church is not leading politics; politics is leading the church, and the church is not standing for godly behavior not just you know everybody boils that down to abortion and lgbtq yeah it, let's just take that there are more godly issues that we need to be worried about the treatment of the poor the treatment of the homeless those who are indigenous those are you know those are the luke four folks that jesus was dealing with um and so i'm always interested in the church when the church wants to talk about involving itself uh, in these in these battles. And so I really, I wanted to understand. And I'm going to tell you, you I'm much different. Than well, and I don't think it has to be a mystery. And I, I mean, I think, I think you can look charitably on people who are different than you, but um, when, when there's all the, the issues in the world, but we need to focus on some, uh, 30 million dead babies is just an easy thing for conservatives to focus on. And then whenever you can acknowledge we're all connected and social fabric, it is uh, one thing that happens to one group happens to another, then our sexual ethics and what we normalize as a society impacts us all. You know, So those two issues being places where conservatives engage makes a lot of sense whenever you put it in those terms. And it's not at the exclusion of others. I don't know any conservatives who just say, I don't care about poor people. I don't care about people from other nations. Nobody says that because very few feel well, that. Well, they don't say it, but they live it. Come on now, we're, we live it, mm. um, and, and I think I think that's my that's my concern. I'm living on a, cam a college campus right now, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting place to be. When October seventh happened, my Jewish students immediately said, "We're scared. Mm -hmm. We put all the resources around them. We wanted them to know that they were loved and they were cared for." But simultaneously, we went to our Palestinian students and we told them, "You are loved and cared for." This conflict is going to affect both of you. It's going to affect both your lives and all your families. And we are sorrowful for that, but we recognize what's getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. What I have found incredibly interesting is that I abhor what Hamas has done. Israel is one of the most beautiful countries and it is one of my favorite countries. And it is where probably my faith deepened mm -hmm. more. But I will say this, I cannot ignore the cries of Palestinian mothers either. 
So I like to tell people I'm for the mothers and the children. And if we could at least say that there is an equality of suffering that we all should be concerned about, then I would probably feel better. But I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing that preached. I am not hearing that taught from many of my brothers and sisters who are conservative. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is this. Having, having a child who is gay, a lot of people could not sit here and, and say, and hear you say, you see it as evil. Mm -hmm. I would say that I see him as a loving man of God who loves Jesus Christ with all his heart, who loves the United Methodist Church, and, and who is so sacred to me and to God. Mm -hmm. I wish there could be room to acknowledge that maybe God, who could place his spirit in almost anything, could place his spirit within lesbian and gays and recognize that they can be used for the transformation of the world as well. Um, that's, that's the room that I hope, that, that I've always prayed for. Now, does it make me not enjoy our conversation any less. No, because I'm listening to you. I'm hearing you. Um, I love the way that, you know, my own criticism of my own side sort of affirms some things. But I want to be really clear. It is about bridge building for me. Mm -hmm. It is about the Jesus of Luke 4, the Jesus of John. I'm not so much a fan of the Jesus of Matthew, but I still read that one. I just think Matthew is kind of boring. Gail O'Day was my teacher, so I like John a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe in this Jesus that called us all, called the poor, called those who have been neglected, turned the social system upside down. And so if I follow a Christ that turns that social system upside down, then I have to recognize that sometimes the social systems that we as human beings set up are not always the social systems that are godly. Mm -hmm. That I'm sure the Pharisees thought they had it going on. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I think Jesus called that into question. He called the laws. He called the rituals. He called all those things into question. So the same Jesus who called him into question over 2,000 years ago, I think that same Jesus might call things into question in 2024. Yeah, it's so not. If that's we're what I'm talking about. If we're threatened by calling things into question, then we're, we're threatened by thinking. You know, we're, we're threatened by being critical thinkers, you know, so there, there shouldn't be reluctance on anyone's part, to my mind, to ask questions and to, to investigate uh, our presuppositions. I, I just think we have to simultaneously accept that other people are going to do the calculus differently and um, that that doesn't make them bad or uh, evil. That just means that we have different loyalties and that there is um, a peaceable place on the other side of that just saying, well, we can't walk together then if we have different loyalties and different values and different worldviews and lenses. And in fact, we do harm whenever we continue to, to try and fit your square peg into my round hole. Um, and, and so there is a, a loving, non-coercive way to be in relationship with people um, that, that we can't be close with, but we can breathe the same air and the sh share the same world with. That does seem to be falling apart at the moment, but I have no question in my mind that, that that's a project that you're interested in. I do think it is a worthy goal I, for us. I'm interested in that project. Yeah. I'm interested in that project, but I'm also interested in the project of Christians walking among the centurions and the Samaritans mm -hmm. and all of those people with whom they, they disagreed with. But yet, one thing that marked the church was that it li lived peaceably with all. Yes. Um, and that in that church, there was difference. And I think that, you know, the, to have an organization and, and just the history of organizations, that was the first time. Pentecost was the first time where people of different races came together other than something under either Greek or Roman or Mesopotamian rule. Mm -hmm. So that Holy Spirit worked for unity. And so that unity did not make a distinction except do you believe that the Ruha of God is within us? And so sometimes I think, I agree with you that I, maybe I cannot, I can work peacefully with everybody except people from Auburn. Um, but 
Um, I can tell you this. Folks who deny the, di the divinity of Christ but call themselves Christians, I'm going to struggle with. Mm -hmm. That is just one-on-one. -on -one. But when we come together, we come to the table and say, I believe Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, born of a virgin. We, we say the Apostles' Creed and we believe that. Then to me, we can figure all the other stuff out. That's what I truly believe. And I think what I'm learning is that believing those, that Apostles' Creed is not enough. And I'm like, well, why did we add all the extra stuff in? If the Apostles' Creed was what was supposed to unite us, which is formative, which in the United Methodist Church, we say as a part of our sacrament of Holy Communion. So if, if those, that thing binds us, then why can't we be bound together? And I think that's the thing. The, the living it out, living out that Apostles' Creed, yes, it's going to look different. Yeah. But did we have to split up our church over it? Well, I mean, the the place that I hope we can, and I don't know, uh, it seems to me I'm not persuading you, but it really does seem to me that if we're using the same words but not meaning the same thing by it, then it's more of a magical incantation that doesn't really mean anything. That that the words themselves are, don't mean anything without the shared meaning. And what fell apart in the UMC, what's falling apart all around us is that that we don't mean the same things by the words that we're saying. And that, that means that the connection we have by those words is phony and isn't going to be able to hold us together. I, I also well, want you to hear me. Yeah. And I know you've listened to conservatives all along, so it's, it's distressing to hear you say it at this point, but there aren't any conservatives that are going to deny that gay people are made in the image of God um, and, or that God loves them. There, there's, I mean, if there is one, uh, I, I will turn against them so quickly, you know, that the, the question is not, does God love them? Did God make them? Um, the question is more fundamentally, are we defined by our sexual desires? Is that a, a valid point of identity? Is that something that God made me as, or is that a place where uh, the corruption of all creation can extend to? And we have a legitimate disagreement there, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't necessarily need to persuade anybody, but I, I don't think it. I don't think we're going to get very far in reconciliation or sharing in a, a common fabric if we misrepresent the other side. And so, if that is what you've understood conservatives to be believing all along, then I would ask you to reconsider your your. I would call it a caricature of hateful conservatives, and and consider that perhaps you've misunderstood their theological. Um, uh, understanding of the issue. Well, and I would say by the same token. So first of all, um, I have, con you know, this sounds very plithy, but I have conservative friends. Um, and so, no, do I believe that there is love? Um, but then again, we can say we may disagree what is love. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. How do we live out that love? But yeah. I think the same thing is that we're all not over here wearing Birkenstocks and dreads right um that we are people who are really trying to think about how do we bring the gospel into the world in a legitimate way uh -huh. and recognize the humanity of all and the the potential of all humanity uh -huh. to bow their knee to jesus christ and what does that look like right um what does it mean to be an inclusive church um and that's going to vary i mean that it, just like a spectrum but it doesn't mean that we are all Marxist communists who are seeking to take over the world and indoctrinate children and sacrifice them on the altar at a pizza parlor. If you heard um, me say that, I would immediately take that back. I, I, I'm <laughs> not lumping you in with some people that I do fit, I do think fit into that category. And I, uh, and, but and no, that's. Let's just admit that we have extremes on both sides that are not being very helpful hmm. to us living together. Okay. Um, and, and that's what I would argue is sure. that the vast majority of people are not on those extremes. The vast majority of people are in sort of what I call a moderate pr uh, pragmatic framework mm -hmm. who really do want to see the other, their neighbor do well. Yes. Who want to see their other, the neighbor thrive. Yeah. Who want to see their other, their neighbor be safe. I really believe that. Now, I could be, you know, crazy, but I do believe that. And I do believe that about people within the church. 
So when I hear anybody on the left characterize all conservatives some way, I stop them. Mm. When, I, when I hear someone characterize conservatives, I mean liberals the same way, I'm going to stop them. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, I'm willing to let you know, the good Lord figure out a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's a terrible witness for the body of Christ. The last few years, we have been a terrible witness for the body of Christ. Uh, a terrible witness for Christ that that the only way to get along is to break up. And mm. so I really did do a study. I mean, if we look, is it biblical to break up? And if we look at even Paul, Paul made the choice to break up. He mm. wasn't directed by God to break up. Paul chose to leave and break off. Mm. So what we see is as humans, we may break off, but it doesn't mean, mean that that was the intent for the church by Christ. Um, and, I, and I think there's just the acknowledgement that I stand on, was that we could be distinctive, because the Ethiopian church is not going to be like, you know, the Roman church, and it's not going to be like the church in Constantinople. We may worship different, we may have different liturgy, but we stand on the idea of Christ. Um, mm -hmm. And so I am, I am perplexed that we have taken it upon ourselves to say it is too, it is too hard to live together and we're mm -hmm. going to break up. Mm -hmm. um, because that really is the model that the world sees. And basically, for folks who decry the breakup of the family, mm -hmm. this is exactly what we've done. We've said, I can't get along with you I find you too abusive. I don't want to go to counseling. And I say it on both sides. We both did that. We both did it. Whether it was political machinations or whether it was the outright just in your face actions of uh, some of my colleagues on the West Coast, we both said, we, we both were talking out of both sides of our mouth when we said we really wanted to go to therapy. Maybe we never did. Maybe we just couldn't figure out how to split the stuff up. So. You know, here's, here's what I'm going to say to you, my brother, in closing. This has been one of the most fascinating conversations that I've had. And I want to thank you for your ministry. Because I think it's so important for us to at least listen to people on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, to listen to people that we may not be happy listening to. There will be friends of mine who will listen to this and be absolutely angry with me. And that'll be okay. Yeah. And there'll be people who will, who will listen to this and swear I'm some kind of Marxist, whatever. Here's what I want them to know about me. I am just a country girl from Alabama who married a United Methodist minister and became one herself, who has really four beautiful children, a very mischievous dog, teaches on a college campus and wants to see her students be world changers. I believe in grace and I believe that is the foundation of everything we should do. Mm -hmm. And I believe in our Lord Jesus and I believe in his salvific power. And I believe we can move toward perfection. That's who I am. That's who I am. And, and so if people walk away from anything else, you're, you're adding it on, that's fine, baby, but that's who I am at my mm. heart. Maria Dixon Hall, thank you so much for spending time with me. Thank you for having me, Jeffrey. Yes, ma'am. Friends, hope you've enjoyed your time with us. If you did, like it, share it, send it to somebody you think would enjoy it. And as always, I appreciate the support for the podcast. I'll see you next time.